Uh, anyway, so thank you so much. Welcome to uh, our guest lecture today with Stella, without Anya. Anya couldn't make it, she but we are, we are privileged to have you, Stella. Thank you. Stella, of course, is a good friend of mine. Okay, we played together as children, mm -hmm. kind of, in Vienna, and then uh, we uh, we are still friends and we are still children, kind of. And <laughs> she's going to tell us about her business. This, of course, is a entrepreneurship class and want to see what people do in businesses to learn from them from their experience and Stella has a lot of experience she worked for Unilever I think and then you you worked in the property with your husband I was and, now, and then you're going, you're going to tell you all of that mm -hmm. so let's listen to her and then we can ask her a few questions over to you Stella you can Thank ask you. any question you like <laughs> you can you sit or you can Stella, uh, walk whatever uh, feel free you know, Thank you. Austria yeah. came 30 years ago to the UK um, my family background was quite mixed like lots of Austrians uh, I'm like a mongrel I have one grandfather who was from Croatia he was a count he had three very large estates and my other grandfather um, had uh, pubs and a theater in Vienna, so they were very different kind of characters. One was very posh, other was very like down to earth. Um, incidentally, the posh grandfather lost everything to communism. Communism also made soup out of a hundred pure race horses, and that was clearly not a good investment. Um, so I personally, I studied uh, chemistry and science of nutrition at the University in Vienna and then got a very good, secure job um, at Unilever. I didn't really want to mention the name, but I just thought it was there. And within a week of working there, I was told that I was working too fast. <laughs> I need to slow down because I wasn't reflecting well on my co-workers because they are obviously always working very slowly. So for by the month I tried to work very slowly, but it was very difficult for me to do that. And probably that whole department could have managed on 40% of the staff. And I like to work hard, I like to play hard, but I also want to reap the benefits of all the work I do. So I decided to throw it all away. My mother had a nervous breakdown, it's a secure job and all the benefits and Austria benefits are much better than many other countries. So, uh, but I, I just couldn't because it's important that you get up in the morning and you really want to do what you're doing and not feel like you're sitting off time in order to get some money somewhere because in the end I think find the job you love and you never work again. And I relocated to London. I got a job first in a small property company in a marketing department and then later in a hotel group. And later I uh, moved to another hotel group that uh, my husband then worked in. I worked first in sales, um, which entailed a lot of travel to all over the world, which was very exciting. I hardly saw any of the sites there, but it was really exciting to meet people from all over the world. And later I specialized in sourcing properties um, with long leases for uh, a hotel group, which entailed going to lots of conferences and networking as well. I really enjoyed that time. It was very fast and involved a lot of drink and socializing and so on. Um, but um, 10 years ago I decided I wanted to live a more settled life and uh, chill a bit. And I thought I opened my own business. I probably walked equally hard in my own business, but it's my own. So, and obviously that type of business was very much led by the experience that I had. So I opened a property management company. And uh, my focus is on development, which is when you like take something and make it nice before it's not nice. And then managing when it's the finished product. And at the time I personally owned two flats and I was quite fed up with how estate agents were charging huge amount of commission for tiny little jobs and also they picked tenants that were actually not very good. So, because I didn't care, they got their commission and if anything went wrong afterwards, it wasn't that problem. And um, another factor was my own experience with my kids where I saw them looking for accommodation in London and I'm sure you have done the same or I, mean, I don't know what you were saying, but uh, a lot of the places were very sad and dismal and uh, Horrible. So I saw there was a niche in the market for like good quality accommodation for young people in London. And uh, around the same time, 10, 15 years ago, a new concept came up in the property industry and it's called PBSA, 
It uh, stands for purpose-built student accommodation. And in today's lending world, that's like the golden ticket. Everybody wants to invest in PBSA because this is the best of the best. And if everybody believes that it's the, the future um, to reap a lot of uh, great yields. And parallel to this, obviously student accommodation is for students, uh, developed something called co-living accommodation, which I'm sure a lot of you, maybe some of you stay in, which are these very large utopian style tower blocks that have gyms and little pubs and restaurants and uh, cinema rooms, some of you have uh, swimming pools, and they were more aimed at like young professionals who can't afford to rent their own flats, so they share basically communal areas with others. And um, traditionally, what co-living is now in these large tower blocks was basically people stayed in something called HMIs, which is another property uh, expression which stands for uh, houses of multiple occupation. They, in, especially in England, had a very, very bad reputation because you had these rogue landlords who had these dingy houses that had mold on the wall and shower rooms with sticky shower curtains where you had to share with seven people. And even the landlords had bad reputations because they wouldn't fix anything, and it, it, it was not very good. So, um, so houses in multiple occupation uh, have a special legal status, and you can't just make any house into a HMO. You need to get a license, and the license you get from the council. And the reason you need that license is, number one, so the council can make a lot of money, because they charge you about 1,300 pounds per license. And secondly, uh, also because HMOs have very different regulations in the sense of safety, there's a fire safety, because if you imagine if you're a family of five, like mother, father, and three children, you live in a family house, there's a fire, the father will run inside and save his children. But if you live in a HMO, you might not like the dude that lives next door, there's a fire, you think, I don't care, I will get out. So you have to basically provide in a HMO better fire safety, which would involve smoke detectors, sprinkler systems. If there are more than uh, seven people in a house, you need a sprinkler system, or more than four floors, as it depends on size and shape of the building. You need fire doors that, that basically hold the fire when there's a fire inside, so that it doesn't come through. And these doors have to be self-closing. I'm sure wherever you live, you have these annoying doors that close all the time, and then you put the wedge under so it doesn't close. This is actually, you're breaking the law when you do that, because any fire that came up could spread. So as a landlord or as an operator, it's really important to uh, not break any of these laws, because you're in a way self-regulated. Here in England, I'm pretty sure in Germany or in other places, there is more uh, government interference in the control. But in England, it's basically it's up to you. And if you break the law and something bad happens, you are liable. It's a criminal crime, so you can go to jail. So it's really important to make sure that all of this works. So I studied quite a long time all these regulations to make sure that there was nothing that is wrong. You can also hire external companies that advise you of how to manage this. So um, the co-living concept, which I mentioned before, which are these very large uh, tower blocks, they came, this concept arose about 10 to 15 years ago, and I, a good friend of mine was one of the first front runners for this kind of development. And it was a very new concept. And I think it's a great concept because it provides a lot of good or better quality accommodation than before, but he actually ran into a very interesting problem because uh, wherever he went to borrow money, the banks were really suspicious. And why were they suspicious? Because they couldn't compare it to anything else that was there before. Because co-living is a young professional who has his own job, so there are no parents guaranteeing the rent. So banks couldn't basically calculate what is their risk when they put money into this. So, and you will see it one day, and it's really important, whatever idea you will have one day as an entrepreneur, you will go to a bank or to somebody who lends you money, and you will have to show them why this is a really, really good idea. And the first thing they do is they will compare you. So your best is you do your homework beforehand and find basically competitors or something as similar as possible where you can show how this makes sense financially and fiscally. Because banks today, um, uh, especially now, there was something called Basel IV. I don't know if you know Basel. It's basically like this big conference 
and it's about banking supervision and it uh, basically addressed the inconsistencies in risk management. This has to do, um, has been made even more stringent now, so banks are even more restricted in how much money they can lend. And so anyone who wants to raise funds is struggling even more at the moment to get hold of these funds. And I'm sure you know, and for the ones who don't know, um, why do the banks need this supervision? Um, I think the easiest way is if you watch the film The uh, Big Short, anybody seen that one? Highly recommend it, because it's a really fun way to learn why banks need to be regulated. And uh, what happened at the time, for the ones who haven't seen it, is basically uh, banks were lending money, sometimes 110 120% of the value of a property to investors, even like individual people. And once a property prices dropped, people couldn't basically pay these uh, interest rates back. And that's where we had this massive banking collapse and property collapse, and it, it was very bad in the whole industry. I mean, I remember that time, it was very dire. So I understand that banks need to be regulated in the sense of how much they lend and who they lend it to and why they're lending it. And um, therefore, when you have a concept, you go somewhere to borrow money, be prepared that we'll go through it and best is to prepare these comparables with the comparison that they want to see. So back to my own story. Um, so I dealt originally in my job with very large developments like student housing and co-living and once I started my own business I wanted to do this co-living enterprise but I realized also during COVID that there was something that is really important to a lot of people which is uh, social connectivity and meeting people and making friends. And some of these very large tower blocks are like hives. And if you're a very sociable person, maybe you will go down into the gym or into the little restaurant and you will make friends. But for a lot of people, it's quite scary. And then they somehow get lost in the crowd. And I then realized the best thing would be is to go for these traditional HMOs with, as they were, but make them better. So I sourced HMOs they were in very bad condition, and um, some were absolutely horrendous. They were used by the council for housing homeless people, asylum seekers, and things like this. Um, I always, I don't go further in zone two. A lot of student housing or co-living is somewhere on the fringes of London. I think it's somehow stupid because who wants to travel 45 minutes to their home? Especially if you let's say you walk in the city and then you have to go out in the evening with your client and then you want to go home afterwards and then it's two in the morning. So, um, so I try to be in zone two. I try uh, to have a tube station at least within five minutes off that place and some infrastructure like shops, restaurants, pubs, and so on. Um, so in the refurbishment, I made sure that I put as many shower rooms into each property as possible. There were very good quality shower rooms, even with like nice details, like mosaic, but very like plain and uh, good quality. Made sure of massive boilers with lots of hot water, very good heating systems, um, professional grade Wi-Fi. So even if some everybody was working from home, they would all have got a problem and use Wi-Fi. Also important, obviously, a pleasant and clean one on furniture, a lot of storage, and my. Kids at the time uh, devised this new advert called Instagrammable. So the, it had to be cool enough that people want to take an Instagram in it. So I implemented all of this. And additionally to that, what we did is we curated our tenants. So we decided this kind of building will appeal to this type of people and we made sure that every single person in this building will get on with the other one. But there's no guarantee. But by checking over, let's say, Instagram, you can see if people will gel or not and have a similar kind of idea of how they want to live. I only pick usually kids where I know they want to get somewhere in life and do something, you know, someone who wants to lay in bed all day and eat crisps. Maybe um, that's like my personal idea of, of, of mentoring as well, uh, which I have done for some of my tenants. And we get on with all our tenants exceptionally well. They have invited us in for cups of tea. And uh, last week, my daughter was invited for dinner. 
So it, it's actually a, a really lovely way to make actually expand your network. So, um, and it's probably a very unusual way to run a property business, but this personal aspect is really uh, important. And additionally, what causes problems in shared accommodation is um, dirt. So we send somebody in to clean it because it's hard to clean something if you don't know who made, made it dirty. So if somebody else comes in and cleans it, that's uh, easily remedied. And a cleaner doesn't cost that much, but a lot of landlords are too stingy to pay for it, which doesn't make sense. Uh, we organize social events, but because, I'm sorry, um, we don't have a gym, we don't have a pool, we don't have a cinema room, therefore we can afford to keep this kind of product for a more affordable price than these large tower blocks and the bedrooms are sometimes three, four times the size. And all have a double bedroom, a double bed, but on single occupancy um, because there's a lot of regulation about overcrowding, so you can't just stick two people into a dump bed, even if you have it, because it would create like 10 people living in a house, and that obviously would also reduce the quality of the experience. So with the last project that we launched, um, I think all the rooms went within two weeks. All the marketing is done on Instagram. Um, we don't use any traditional estate agents at all. Um, it worked actually beautifully because people came in uh, and drones and we picked very carefully who we would have and I highly recommend that if anyone goes into property or wants to rent places out or so on, pick your tenants. Sometimes operators get anxious, they want to fill the room up as fast as possible because they're obviously losing money while it's empty. But maybe these two weeks that you waited for a better tenant might have made a bit of money then, but if this person damages the room or doesn't pay the rent, or you have to, God forbid, get uh, an eviction notice, which is a terrible palaver, then uh, we cost you much more. So uh, picking the right people is, is really important. And in general, in the property industry at the moment, because money is so expensive, so when people say money is expensive, it means you have to pay a lot of interest for any money you borrow. If you're cash rich, you're made at the moment because property at the moment is like 25% cheaper than it was a year ago. Because of these new um, Basel IV rules, banks have been have really great difficulty lending money and it is expensive, so the yield also has to make sense. So it is no point, oh, I'm borrowing this money and I'm building this very nice building, but it doesn't make uh, bring the returns in that you need. <coughs> so the opportunities in the property industry at the moment are obviously what I mentioned is the purpose built student accommodation, which is like the golden child at the moment, co-living. Um, data centers, which I don't know nothing about, but this is obviously logically something that a lot of people would invest in. Uh, assisted living facilities, so that's any kind of place where people live and need help, so they might be old or sick or recovering from something. And that's a very great business, but the investment into staff that has the qualifications to run these places is really big. There's also problems with liability. So I, I would only do that if you had a partner who really understood that aspect of care, basically. And staff is very difficult to source at the moment. Uh, another asset that a lot of people invested in was storage and warehouses. They were a bit overpriced, I think, during COVID. Everybody thought Amazon and everybody was all these deliveries. It's going to be the biggest thing ever, which obviously Amazon will never go away. But for some reason, there was a bit too much investment in storage and warehouses, so I wouldn't buy any of those at the moment. Um, also, a lot of investments were made in life sciences, which is basically laboratories or medical facilities. They turned out to be less lucrative um, than expected. Another thing a lot of people invest in, and there's a big um, uptake in England, uh, is film studios. We don't know anything about film, so um, I can't advise that, but maybe Professor Schmidt can source somebody. Um, 
So as I said, because money is expensive, it's really hard to reap the yields on your investment. So what we did is we basically made it as good as we could, offered services that were extra to be able to charge more for that room, but it was basically a good value to the tenant because they had the cleaner, they didn't have to worry about who is paying which utility bill, they had the social uh, aspect as well. And uh, by adding that added benefit, you can basically charge for this. And this is something that is not connected to what you're paying for the building. And um, a lot of my kids were asking once, uh, what, what have you learned in life that you wish someone had told you at the time? And, and then I, I made them a little book, and I, I took some extras out of it um, to share with you. Um, uh, one sentence I heard a lot is, uh, I don't know if you've heard it before, is that bank managers give you an umbrella when the sun shines, but they take it away when it rains. <laughs> so it is, number one, very, very important to have a good connection to your bank manager. Because it can make all the difference. If you're really in trouble, if he likes you or she likes you, then you will, uh, maybe there will be the difference if you survive or not. Um, also, bank managers want to work as little as possible. And you can use it to your advantage because, um, for example, a friend of mine had a big office building and he had a cash flow problem and his bank manager is getting really nasty and he's sitting there in this office and he's basically with his back to the wall and his bank manager says, I want all my money now and I don't care where you take it from. And he felt this bunch of keys in his pocket with all these offices in this office building. So he took the bunch out and he put it on the table and he said, why don't you run that business yourself? He got up and he left. That was very risky. I, I don't think I would have the guts to do this. But what happened is um, about an hour later, the supervisor of the bank manager phoned him, apologized, invited him back to the bank and gave him a new lending terms and he basically had a new bank manager who was on a higher level, which was much better because that guy had more brains, in a sense. Um, I'm not talking against bank managers in general or banks. All I'm saying is sometimes I think people who work in banks are people who don't want to run a business, and that's why they are in the bank. So they are a little bit, um, they're very driven by numbers, and they don't really sometimes see the heart of a business. And therefore it's important if you actually bring them to your business and show them your business, show them the stuff and show them what you do there and that will make them emotionally much more involved and then they will have your back when you really need them. And I've seen some cases where banks had absolutely no scruples to take away a property and um, I have a friend who developed a very large property uh, and he had bought a hotel for 33 million pounds in central London it was a very clever concept, and unfortunately he went bust in the crash. And the bank sold that very same building back to the original owner for 12 million pounds. So that original owner made 21 million pounds in one year without moving a finger, basically. So, and the bank didn't care about that. They were only interested to get the 12 million back that was theirs. They had no interest in the actual value of that building. Even maybe it wasn't worth 33 million anymore, but maybe it was worth 25 million. They could have sold it for 25, but they were in such a rush to basically recoup that loss and had absolutely no regard for um, basically the waste that they uh, created there. I'm not saying which bank that was. So, um, so um, while you are an entrepreneur and you go around and you network your way around, you will meet lots of lovely people and they all want to sell you money because they're on commission. And they will tell you glorious stories about all these amazing things you can do with all this money. But always remember, you have to pay it back. If you can't pay it back, then these people are not lovely anymore. So never borrow over the eyeballs. Even if people advise you to do it, don't do it. Don't do that deal, don't do that whatever it is, unless you absolutely have to because otherwise it wouldn't work. Try not to do it. Other advice I give is um, lawyers. Always get the best possible lawyer you can afford. Cheap lawyers are a waste of money. They even cost you money, so they, don't, they have the best. 
staff. So as you grow as a business, you will have more and more staff. And that's something really important for staff are basically what keeps your business going. <clears throat> My late mother-in-law had a saying, and she said, staff are paid enemies. It sounds quite hostile, but she was in a way right. And the truth in it lies not in being mean to your staff or treating them badly, it's actually the opposite. Because every single person in your business is important. It can be the cleaner, it can be up to the financial director. That every single person is important. So I personally, and I learned that from my posh grandfather, I always say please and thank you to everyone. If they've done well, I give praise. A lot of bosses don't do that. It's really important to give praise. People love it, it doesn't cost you anything. And uh, I never insult anyone on a personal level, like you, I don't know, you, whatever, slob or whatever, that doesn't work. Or don't sleep with any of them, but I don't. Okay, so, um, not that I've done it, never done it, but I've uh, seen other stories. So, um, other thing is, I never share any private aspects of my life with them. Because, as in the saying, it says, familiarity breeds contempt. Because ultimately, staff goes home at five o'clock, they have a lovely Saturday and Sunday, but you go home and you worry until 10 o'clock about whatever you're worrying about. You got up on Sunday morning at seven o'clock because the boiler broke down somewhere and there's no plumber to be found who can fix it, it has to be fixed, so it will be you who will stand outside that building and find a plumber for that boiler. And your staff doesn't really take that in, so all they see is, oh, you know, this dude has this business and they're doing really well. Now they're going to Barbados on holiday, outrageous. So all my holidays are in Brighton. They were all very nice. That's the end of story. I don't share any of this because it's in a way none of their business. But I, I respect them for the work they do and they know me, but they don't know too much about me. And also with staff, what's important to remember is that uh, as your business grows, the staff are the ones who will push to expand. They will push to expand as fast as possible and as big as possible. And if that happens, you actually create a beast and you won't be able to control that beast. So um, I always consider each expansion uh, double check, does it make sense and is it in your interest? Because staff will tell you, oh, it's a great idea, we get another building, we get another desk, because this way we'll have we'll be so much bigger and we look so much better on social media and on the website and so on. But quality comes before quantity, and it will also improve your uh, quality of life, which is ultimately why we work. We want to have a good quality of life and not be so stressed. And also a very good saying I've learned is turnover is vanity and profit is sanity. So the banks again and your staff, they will push you to grow as fast as possible because they reap the benefit if you grow as fast as possible, but you don't, you, are, you carry only the risk. So be smart and say no, thank you very much. I think this is not a good idea and um, move on. Um, one thing is also don't be afraid. I think a lot of things go wrong because people are afraid and don't want to ask a question or they're afraid that we look stupid. But ultimately you can't know everything. So I've dealt with building projects and the builder said to me, oh, we have to rip this whole system out. It's all broken, we have to replace everything. So then what you do is you go and ask questions. And these questions are not embarrassing. If you have every right to ask a question, you're paying the bill. You say, why is this, what does the system do? Where does it go? How can it be done? Why is this broken? Where does it, what does it look like? And once tradesmen see, or any kind of supplier, uh, sees that you're really interested in the workings of what they supply, they actually gain more respect for you. And they will see that you're not a sheep. They will try it on. They think like, oh yeah, tell up to do all this whole electric, everything has to be rewired. Once you ask the questions of why and when and where, maybe you realize you don't have to rewire everything or put a whole new boiler system in. But uh, also, if in the process you see, yes, the tradesman is right, it has to be replaced. And if I'm in doubt, I always go for all new rather than doing a brushed up job. But in general, sometimes it's not necessary. Um, <clears throat> 
if you have to get a new system, whatever it is, you will at least understand what you need, why you need it, how big should it be, do you need it that big, you need a smaller system box, how long should it last, and how can you repair it? That's also very important. And therefore, it's important to understand a lot of things where a lot of people say, oh, no, that's too much for me, I don't want to know. And another thing uh, with advice that I would like to give is uh, when you buy a property, hire a good surveyor. This is the guy who checks the property out and sees what's wrong with it. And that can be on the legal aspect and physically the bricks that you see. And good lawyers. Estate agents, I personally, I hope nobody is an estate agent here, um, don't believe anything they say. They, in England, they can make verbal, even, even written promises, and they don't have to be true. So whatever you're told, and they are very good salespeople out there, double check it, triple check it, and make sure uh, that uh, this works for you. Because the estate agent only wants to make a quick sale, they don't care. So another thing that's really important um, as an entrepreneur is to know your own limitations. As I said, nobody is perfect. So maybe you're really good at design, or you're really good at sales, but you hate numbers and spreadsheets, then get a really good PA who loves numbers. Or if you are really good at maths, but you don't know anything about colors or design, don't go and start designing anything because you, you know you don't know, so hire someone who can do it better. And there's no shame in having that limitation. The only shame applies if you hide your limitation and you spend lots of time and money and effort to basically hide that you actually don't know something. And that's a waste of time for lots of people in a business. And I say to my staff, if you make a mistake, tell me you made a mistake and we fix it together. And I'm very polite when they tell me and I even praise them because in lots of businesses so much money is wasted because people waste hours and hours to build constructs that cover up whatever mess they made and that construct might make even more problems in your business than the original mistake that was maybe tiny. And it really hampers productivity also uh, blame culture. If I see anyone coming to me, um, oh, so and so the business, this one's full. I, 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 I don't like people like that. I'm not having any of this. And even myself, if I make a mistake, and I know my staff can see that I made a mistake, or even if they don't know, I will say, you know what, it was a bad decision I made that was completely wrong, and they really respect you for it. And even in your private life, you have maybe got a girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, mess up, you say, you know what, I completely messed this up. The respect you get for that is so enormous, much better than people who find these long-winded excuses of why somebody else is to blame for it. Another thing in the property industry, but probably applies to many other businesses, is uh, never cheat. So sometimes it seems really tempting. And um, I remember I went to a lunch, and there was this guy, and he sat next to me, and he was like this kind of villa dealer. And he said to me, oh, you know, the building here around the corner, the guy wants to sell it. And I thought, oh, which building? And I went home, and I checked, oh, it's this building. And I got hold of the guy and managed to meet the person. And then this first person called me and said, hey, I told you about this. So by law, you could say, you know what? I don't care, we don't have a contract. I don't care what you told me. I found this person, I do that deal, I don't need you. But what happens then is that this person will still be around and one day will come and bite you. One day that person might have an amazing deal but they will not phone you, they will make sure you never find out about it. So, to be stingy on a little amount of money in that case is, is not worth it. So you go, and even if that person doesn't know about it, that's even better. You phone them up and say, you know what, you told me this thing at lunch, and I actually met that person, and they want to send me this. I want to thank you for this, so I want to send you this and that. And either you send them a present or a card, or usually it's commission if they want it, because cash is king. And uh, it makes sense to do that. So. Um, so um, another thing I saw uh, was be brave and oversell yourself. You know, a lot of people nowadays, they feel like, oh, I'm not, 
good enough, I'm too young, or I don't know anything, and whatever. You know what, just go out and make yourself look as good as possible. Be brave, and I had a PA who came applied for the job, and I saw straight away from her CV that she wasn't qualified enough for the job. And then she said something very clever to me, and I recommend it to anyone who wants a job. She said, I will work for free for two weeks, try me. And I thought, free, two weeks, free, come in, you know? And so five years later, she told me, you know, I had absolutely no freaking clue what I was doing. I Googled everything. I told myself how to do Excel, uh, everything. And I said, I know, but I've seen you. You worked harder than anybody else in this whole business. And it was, she was the best PA I ever, ever had. And unfortunately, she had a baby and left, but um, I miss her. Um, another thing is trust your stomach. If you are... Um, in a situation and your head is telling you all the time that the numbers don't make sense or this and this says if your stomach says something listen to your stomach and i i'll tell you this because 30 years ago i was driving with my husband through an area in london and i saw this very large red brick warehouse with this black crystal very large black crystal windows and everything inside was full with rubbish like old cloth or rolls of whatever and took dirty I looked at the building, I said, this is amazing. Uh, we should buy this and turn this into a hotel. And he said, nah, who would come to this area here? Anyway, that building is now a loft apartment around the corner from the Nobu Hotel in Shoreditch. So I told him the other day, you know, that was a really bad mistake <laughs> because we would have bought it really cheap at the time. So sometimes, even if you don't know the area or you don't know a place, maybe you know better than the person who lives there because you're looking at it with an outside perspective. So if your stomach tells you something, follow it up, research it, see, read up on the area or read up on whatever area you're trying to explore. And it really makes sense. Um, and uh, another little note, which is maybe more personal, but um, I'm sure some of you have families that might be able to help you if you want to start a business one day. And as long as the families don't bind you to some onerous conditions, like in, I don't know, in succession or something like this, um, take the help. Because I think today there's this whole mentality out there that a kid that comes from a family that has done well is somehow bad and needs to be treated with contempt. But first, you didn't ask to be born. Secondly, coming from successful families is a lot of pressure sometimes. There's a lot of expectation and uh, also uh, a lot of stress involved with it. So you earned who you are. And if you have someone who wants to help you, it can be your godfather, your god uncle, your mother, your father, or whoever, then let them help you, and don't let this whole mentality bug you down. And you have to be grateful for the chances that uh, others don't have. And you have to prove to the world that you are worth it, and also help others that don't have the same chances, and not as lucky as you. But this mentality, at the moment, I see a lot of kids that are somehow giving up, because there's this kind of... Um, it's quite aggressive in a way, I perceive it. But um, so I would say, be confident, go up with your head held high, and I also believe in epigenetic that you learn a lot through your genes and you bring it with you into your new life. You might not know it, but you do. And with that, I uh, hope it all goes well. And if anyone wants to connect and ask me questions, uh, I know mainly about poverty, but anything else I can help with, I'm very happy. Thank you so much. <laughs> you have some questions? You've got a question. Gagger. Uh, yeah, in the beginning, when you started your company, uh, were you only financing your uh, properties through uh, loans, or did you have investors? The first property I actually had, I based on uh, three townhouses that were um, that I owned already, and they were in a terrible condition, and I had rented them for 20 years to the council, and they were so bad that the council even didn't want them. So when I looked at them, I thought I'd start with those, but I put my own money into these first three. But on top of that, once this was all up and running, you obviously can go bring the comparable to the bank. 
and you can show, look, I did this, I put so much money in, people are paying so and so much in rent, and this is what you can get out of it. And that's when it's much easier to get the money than if you go in the beginning, because bank managers haven't got a lot of imagination. So you show them some shoddy house where everything is not in a good place, they, they can't see. And therefore, if you have the chance and you have the cash from anywhere or anyone, take, take that cash and start that way. And it's not fair to the wider world, I agree, but at the same time, if you can't do it, and I, just, I feel really happy because I, I give homes to so many young people in London who are really happy, and so I made a difference in the world, and that makes me happy too, so, um, yeah. You had a question? Yeah, I just, <clears throat> I thought about, I don't know if you want to speak about it, but how like big is your portfolio today or how many uh, properties uh, do you run? So I you? try to keep a, a low profile and I do that because I, it, it makes my life much easier. Because you don't have them, people saying, oh, yeah, she has dinner. So it, 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 it makes it better. So I think at the moment I'm housing, I think, 120 young kids. So I'm not the biggest operator in the world, but at the same time, it's all mine, and I have full control over it. And uh, it's, um, yes, <laughs> that's what I do. Yeah, At which interest rate would you buy properties again? So that's an interesting one, because at the moment, prices are really low, interest rates are coming down, and there's always the big question, everybody's discussing, will it go up, will it go down, where will it go? And I don't think it would ever go as low as it was before. Um, at the moment, it's coming down, and I think it all depends on the property itself, because besides what you're paying in interest for the money that you need to buy it, you also have to look at the capital appreciation, which means if you own it for 20 years, but maybe your yield wasn't as high as you could have done on another business, the property will go up in value. So uh, you have to look at both of that, and it depends on what it is and what you can do with it. So uh, if you um, open, let's say, a care, a care home or uh, assisted living facility, you can charge an extraordinary amount of money. And then your yields will be really high, and then you can afford to pay more for it. So it's, it's all about what you can do with it and what it's, um, what it will be worth in the future. So let's say if you feel in your gut instinct this, this area is going to come up, then it might come up and then it will be worth much more in 10, 15 years time, which is how most wealthy people in England made their money. So that's why I was surprised that nobody was interested in real estate, so. <laughs> yeah, we could, yeah. Um, how are you usually financing your projects, like lending from the bank or co-investing in bigger projects, or how, how do you normally go about that? So I invest originally some of my own funds, and then I borrowed money from a bank, and I also have a very dear friend that I met at a, a property fair in Cannes, and she's one of the big shots. I can send you around, actually, if you want to. Yeah, we invite her, yes. You know Candice? No. No. Okay. Now she's she's good fun. Uh, so she's she, the next one. She's a follow up. Yeah. Now she uh, she basically does these really big deals where she lends money to massive players who borrow 200, 300 million, mezzanine lending and all, all these very complicated structures. And uh, she has basically runs this outfit where people with money come in and say we want to invest the money they find something to invest in. So some money I got from a bank and some is a private investor who invested into me and she's the broker in the middle. But obviously from her point of view, when the interest rates all went up and property prices went down, for them it's also risky because if an operator then is struggling to pay back then their investor will obviously put fire under them. So it's a, it's a different kind of system, but it's, it's in a, it's, that's why the network is important and know the right people to just walk into the branch of whatever bank on the high street is not going to work us. So, uh, it's, it, you need to have a lead. And the best lead is to go to these conferences. And there's all kinds of weird conferences and you just walk around, you talk to everyone, give everybody your card, and then you meet one person who recommends it to another person. That's how you can find the right source. <laughs> <laughs>
or whatever. Yeah. I have two questions for you. Yeah. One is an educational one, and the other one has to do with the business. What do you recommend to people to learn yeah. to get into any business, in particular into the property business? Is there anything that you recommend that these are undergrad students here? Mm -hmm. Should they do their postgrad now in property management? Should they become surveyors? Or can you just start like you? You got a degree mm -hmm. in chemistry. Which I mean, so, yeah, but, <laughs> which you don't use, and you became a very successful property uh, investor with yes, yeah. your husband and now your um, own. So is there something on the uh, educational side, or can you just pick it up yourself? I think it depends what your where your strengths are. So if you're really good and you like structural stuff and physics and maths, and you learn to be a surveyor, you will do really well. I think if you have actually the knowledge of a surveyor, you can go to these property auctions. They go and look at these buildings yourself whenever you have time and you can see immediately what is wrong with it and what you have to spend on it. But if you're not into physics and, uh, and, and building stuff and whatever, then you know this is your limitation, so you need to get somebody else to do this. So you have to look at what are you good at. So are you really good at sales? Are you really good with people? Uh, maybe you don't need to study anything. At the same time, Anything you study will bring it up one level up. And I saw with my own daughter who studied uh, business management in Leeds, where she got a first. And she worked um, in finance for a year as well. And she's really good with people. And she goes around and chats with them. But it does help if you understand basic ideas about business and what, how investment cycles work and so on. So um, if you. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you said, what yeah. you should study. Um, I think go for what you, where your heart is. I think people think too much with their head, and they think, oh, my father wants me to study law, and I study law, but you're a really bad lawyer. That's such a waste of time. So I think study the closest to what you want to do that you are good at. So if you really, I mean, there are lots of interior designers out there, so I wouldn't recommend doing that. But maybe study architecture or study, um, Business management is always a good one because any business you can manage by having a business management degree. And uh, if you're able to do physics and all of that stuff, then go into anything like surveyors or whatever. Everybody needs them. Architects or uh, structural engineers. But that's obviously a very hard thing to study and it's not necessarily everybody's cup of tea. So, um, so come from where your natural strength lies and home in from that direction. That's Thank you so much. It was fascinating. Thank you so much for oh, your explanation, oh. for your insight in particular. Mm -hmm. And I think we learned a lot. I think rather than studying it, we learned it by inviting you and getting you as a guest speaker. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you come back and perhaps some of your I friends. Come back and 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 your next time Thank you so much. And of course you're invited to uh, connect with uh, uh, Stella, who is on LinkedIn. Stella? Who uh, is Stella? I'm Stella. I'm sorry. Who? Oh, you can connect. Yeah, you can connect with me. Yes. Who is Stella? I'm Stella. LinkedIn very much, uh, but you're very welcome to connect with me, and um, I will obviously reply. If you have any questions, or you have suddenly an idea, or you're not sure, maybe I know someone who can help you. I'm, I'm very much for mentoring and helping kids because you're the future, and you need to get somewhere, and uh, it's happy to do that. Very good. And Thank I you. wish you all good luck. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.